Hey everybody, welcome back to SoGal. Roger here says hey. This video that I am going to be watching today has been a very highly requested one. Admittedly, I've kind of been putting it off because I feel like it's a bit of a touchy subject and one that I am very ignorant about. Now, of course, I'm aware of America's role in slavery. I was born and raised in the South. I have a lot of cotton fields and old plantations surrounding me. There are Civil War battlefields not that far away. And so I feel like I'm surrounded by a lot of physical, actual reminders of it here in the U.S. And my perception which could be wrong, maybe this video is going to prove me wrong, has always been that Britain aided America in the slave trade. Now I know that Great Britain did put an end to slavery I think in the 1830s, which was a good 30 years or so before the United States did it, which makes me think that Britain also had slaves, but I don't know. Like I, I feel like you guys over in the UK wouldn't have had the same like agricultural economy that we did over here in the southern US, although maybe they were used in a different capacity. I don't know. Maybe Great Britain didn't have slaves. Again, like I said, I am very ignorant of the whole subject, honestly, and I really don't know what Britain's role in it was. So this video is going to, I think, educate me a bit on that. Now, I had some warnings in the comments that this is also a little bit controversial as well. So, so this is probably one of those videos where you can't, like, take it as a black and white thing. And by that, I don't mean race. I mean, like... <laughs> absolute or not. So anyway, I'm not going to say much about it. We're just going to go ahead and jump right into this video. If you're not subscribed yet, make sure you do that. And if you enjoy this video, make sure you hit the like button. And I appreciate it. But for now, let's see just kind of what Britain's role was in ending slavery, I'm assuming, in history. Britain's criminally stupid attitudes to race and immigration are beyond parody by Frankie Boyle. For those who aren't aware, Frankie Boyle is a famous Scottish comedian who is most renowned for being pretty damn offensive. Needless to say, I'm a fan of his. And so when Frankie Boyle writes an article for The Guardian of all places with the subtitle The Anti-Immigration Election Rhetoric is Perverse, we fear the arrival of people we have drawn here with the wealth we stole from them I can see the misinformation coming a mile away. So Frankie begins the article by waffling in an overly verbose manner, reminiscent of Charlie Brooker, another man who I am a fan of, but has been led astray by misinformation. And it's full of these sort of contradictions that I'm sure sounded good when he was writing them, but when you actually think about it, are rather silly. I mean, here he is pointing out the irony of the leaders being nationalist and warning about the Scottish National Party after making a crack about how the Scottish discovered penicillin and taking credit for this for some reason. And for some reason he seems to mix up the concepts of trade and immigration. But these really aren't very important. I'm not even bothered that he just assumes that an Australian-style point system for immigration will obviously be a racist system that caters exclusively to white people. You know, this is despite the fact that a Cambridge economics professor has warned the sheer scale of immigration has caused problems for the UK's infrastructure, which was largely built in the 70s. But you know what, none of that really bothers me. What really bothers me is Frankie Boyle's attempt to make British people feel ashamed of Britain's involvement in the slave trade. That really gets my goat, because Britain's involvement in the slave trade is one of the most proud accomplishments of British history. And I know what you're thinking, oh my goodness, slavery is bad. And that's correct. Which is why the British ended it. For everyone. If we just take a cursory look at the subject, you can see how it is not nearly as cut and dried as Frankie makes it out to be. Even the very word slave comes from Slav, because of the sheer number of Slavs taken as slaves by conquering peoples. But Frankie is trying to drum up white guilt. So Wait, what? I mean, I thought slaves had been around for, I mean, since ancient times. They've been around since basically the beginning of civilization, as far as I'm aware. Did we just not start calling them slaves until later in history or something? I don't, I don't get that. I mean, it kind of makes sense, you know, with with the 
etymology and stuff, but I don't know. By conquering peoples. But Frankie is trying to drum up white guilt. So let's talk about African slavery. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to start exploring the West African coast, and they did indeed capture African natives to be brought back to Portugal as items of curiosity. Europeans who travelled to Western Africa discovered that Western Africa had civilizations of its own. For example, a Dutch visitor to Benin City wrote in around 1600, As you enter it, the town appears very great. You go into a great broad street, not paved, which seems to be seven or eight times broader than the warmest street in Amsterdam. The houses in this town stand in good order, one close and even with the other, as the houses in Holland stand. More than a century earlier, Benin exchanged ambassadors with Portugal. The Portuguese did take a few Africans back to Europe, but they didn't need to set up operations because they discovered that there were already thriving slave trades in Africa. And so they bought slaves from African rulers and traders. The vast majority of slaves taken out of Africa were sold by African rulers, traders and military <coughs> aristocracy who grew wealthy from the business. Most slaves were acquired through wars or by kidnapping. And before you... St I mean, this is something I've heard uh, people make points about in the past, was that Africans had slaves. Like, they enslaved their own people. So it wasn't just, you know, Europe Europeans that did it or whatever. So I guess that's what he's talking about here. Um, the African leaders enslaved their own people, basically, and participated in selling slaves. Well, you start thinking that this is excessively barbaric... This was the standard for almost every civilized society yeah. all across the world. For example, yeah. in ancient... That, that's, point, that's a point I've made in previous videos that have touched on this, was that that was just like part of life back then. It was, I guess, considered... I mean, obviously it's not acceptable to us today by our standards, but back then it was just kind of like a normal part of life and I'm not sure how many people actually questioned it. I'm sure there were some, but I've always kind of like stood my ground with saying that it's really, really, I think, questionable to um, judge people in history based on our current modern standards of things because life was different back then. Morals were different, standards were different, lifestyles were different, and I feel like that a few hundred years from now, people are going to judge us today by things that we think that are, that are fine, they're going to think we're reprehensible. It's just like, I feel like you have to be really careful about judging history in, in some ways. So I kind of agree with what this guy is uh, saying right here, although, I don't know, he might put some twists on it here that I'm not expecting. Ancient Greece. Strabo tells us that the island of Delos trafficked in 10,000 slaves a day, even before the Roman Empire, even when we're coming to the end of the Roman Republic in the 1st century BC. It's estimated that a third of Italy was made up of slaves. Slaves made up of people whom the Romans had conquered and taken back to Italy to do hard labour. I mean, the Egyptians and are so another to one. anyone even slightly educated on this subject, it is absolutely unsurprising to find that, for example, in 1510, the capital of the Empire of Songhai was teeming with slaves. Slave trading in West Africa was common, but it was different to what you expect. It wasn't for commercial purposes. It was to show status and to give the wealthy African elite a comfortable life. And with the appearance of Europeans desperate to buy slaves for use in the Americas, the character of African slave ownership changed. Indeed it did. The character of slavery on the west coast of Africa changed to look a lot more like the character of slavery on the east coast of Africa, because we're going to talk about the Arab slave trade, specifically the circumstance of Swahili-speaking peoples. Unsurprisingly, the Arabs, being far closer to sub-Saharan Africa than the Europeans, had been taking advantage of it for far longer. They were a people with as much commercial nous as anyone else. The ruling class of coastal Swahili society, sultans, government officials and wealthy merchants, used non-Muslim slaves as domestic servants and to work on farms and estates. And they even had plantations, such as the Omani Sultan Said Said, 
who became immensely rich when he started up clove plantations in the 1820s with slave labour. Arab Muslims settled along the coast and intermixed with the locals, forming a people and culture known as Swahili, which started in around the 10th century AD. So unsurprisingly, the East Africa slave trade was well established long before Europeans arrived on the scene and was driven by demands for labour by the sultanates of the Middle East. You See, that is something I knew absolutely nothing about. I had no idea that the Arabs were involved in Africa like that. I, I guess uh, my point earlier was that there was slavery going on in Africa well before the Europeans ever arrived there. And I'm not making an excuse. Please don't, please don't take any of these comments as me making <laughs> excuses for slavery like it's, you know, like I'm saying it's an okay thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just making observations here. You might be thinking, well, that's interesting. If the Arabs had been in Africa for about a thousand years, taking sub-Saharan African slaves, why isn't there a very large population of black people in Arabia? And the answer to that is that the Arabs used to castrate them, cock and balls entirely, a practice that was supposed to have ended in 1962 when slavery was finally outlawed in places like Saudi Arabia. This, of course, does not mean that the mm. trade has actually stopped. It is still going on today. It's impossible to know exactly how many slaves the Arabs took from sub-Saharan Africa. Wait, it's still going on exactly today? Helped. It is still going on. Of course, does not mean that the trade has actually stopped. It is still going on today. It's impossible to know exactly really? how many slaves the Arabs took from sub-Saharan Africa on the East Coast. But one historian produced a total of 17 million slaves. I doubt it was that high, but again, we can't know. And it was for over a thousand years that this was happening. Yeah. The point is that slavery was ubiquitous. No matter where on earth you travelled, you found slaves in Europe in China, in the Middle East, in the New World, in India, in Scandinavia, in Africa. Slavery was as common an institution as animal husbandry. The only thing that mm -hmm. separated the Christian nations of Western Europe from anyone else on Earth was the efficiency with which they could transport taken slaves. And it should come as no surprise that this was made possible by advances in technology that the rest of the world simply didn't have. The most oh. common number I could find regarding the total number of slaves taken from Africa by Europeans was 11 million, and that is in about a 400 year time wow, span. Wow, look at this, look at these numbers. Portugal, Spain, France, over, well, in the millions here. Holland, even Holland took more than the US. Britain, 2.6 million, wow. I wasn't expecting this. Portugal took the most slaves, with over four and a half million transported to the New World. Then Britain, with over two and a half million. Then Spain and France, totaling just under three million. And just so no one is under any illusions, the transatlantic slave trade must have been close to hell on earth. Slaves were taken from Africa yeah. and packed into conditions so Just... disgraceful and disgusting it is unsurprising that there was such a high mortality rate for the crossing. As offensive as this is to look at, we have to remember that this is a consequence of dehumanisation. The slaves yeah. were not people, they were chattel. It will obviously come as absolutely no surprise that the driving motivation behind slavery was economic. Portuguese merchants traded with Africans from trading posts they set up along the coast. They exchanged items like brass and copper bracelets for such products as pepper, cloth, beads and slaves, all part of an existing internal African trade. But the transatlantic slave trade really took off when Christopher Columbus discovered the New World. The Portuguese initially had a monopoly on the slave trade, but this was broken in the 16th century when England, followed by France and other European nations, entered the trade. Unsurprisingly, this was a massively profitable trade for everyone involved except the slaves. Africa's rulers, traders and military aristocracy protected their interest in the slave trade. They discouraged Europeans from leaving the coastal areas to venture to the interior of the continent. 
European trading companies realised the benefit of dealing with African suppliers and not unnecessarily antagonising them. The companies could not have mustered the resources it would have taken to directly capture the tens of millions of people shipped out of Africa. It was far more sensible and safer to give Africans guns to fight in the many wars that yielded captives for trade. The slave trading network stretched deep into Africa's interior. Slave trading firms were aware of their dependency on African suppliers. And these African suppliers were making insane amounts of money. For example, the King of Benin was making £250,000 a year selling people into slavery in 1750. And his successor said in the 1840s that he would do anything the British wanted him to do, apart from giving up the slave trade. Quote, The slave trade is the ruling principle of my people. It is the source and the glory of their wealth. The mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph over an enemy reduced to slavery. I mean, that is the reason why slavery persisted here in the U.S. as long as it did, was because the southern U.S. was highly dependent on the slaves for their exports, like the cotton exports, which I know went to the Great Britain. So basically, like, ending slavery threatened to basically ruin the entire economy of the South. And so we see here, like even over in Africa, the, the main reason they kept slavery going was money. I guess the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Not money, but the love of money is. With an industry so profitable to so many people involved and so widespread as to be common to almost every nation on earth, why? Would the British want King Gezo to give up the slave trade? Well, oh, this we is need to interesting. turn back the clock to 1066 and the Battle of Hastings, when a French-speaking Duke of Viking descent called William the Bastard defeated King Harold Godwinson of England. William the Bastard was refashioned as William the Conqueror and took the crown of England. And one of the th yeah, this we we learn, actually learn about all of this stuff in history over here in the U.S. But it's been a very very long time, like many 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 years since I have studied any of this. But these names are all ringing a bell for me, and of course, 1066 is also ringing a bell. So we do learn about this stuff in the U.S. over here. I think a lot of uh, Brits don't know that that we actually do study this stuff it's hard to remember stuff that you learned in school a really long time ago so this is stuff i have to go back and like relearn now as an adult was refashioned as william the conqueror and took the crown of england and one of the th first things he did as king of england was to have the entire country inventoried this record was known as the doomsday book and we still have it thanks to this hard work we know that Around 1086, 10% of the recorded population of England were slaves. 20 years earlier, when he had first conquered England, William had enacted a series of laws, one of which prohibited the slave trade out of England. I prohibit the sale of a man by another outside of the country on pain of a fine paid in full to me. We don't know what William's motivation for making this law was, but given that the punishment for breaking it was a fine, I doubt it was for humanitarian reasons. Okay, so that 10% of the British population being slaves, that answers my question that Britain did have slaves. Probably, again, like, I don't know what they used them for, whether it was for agriculture or, like, some other reasons, maybe. But uh, it answers my question about that. This is really interesting about William the Conqueror, though. Um, and his mo I wish they knew his motivation because like that I feel like that's a key bit of information that's missing here. Whatever his reasons, within a generation of 1086, slavery had almost died out in England, presumably because William the Conqueror had outlawed the trade of slaves. There appears to also have been a trend for lords to endow their slaves to perform their ploughing functions as free ploughmen. While not a wonderful okay. state of affairs, serfdom is better than chattel slavery. And this. Okay, so they were being used for agricultural reasons and also 1086, so that was way back. I was thinking more modern times, um, slaves being in Britain, so maybe they weren't in more modern um, centuries. Plowman. While not a wonderful state of affairs, serfdom is better than chattel slavery. And this state of affairs was solidified by the church at the Synod of Westminster in 1102 where the church 
denounced simony, clerical marriages and slavery. This made England a very unique case. There probably wasn't another country in the world at this time that had outlawed slavery. There were practically no motivations to do so. It was incredibly lucrative, endemic to the point of normalcy, so it wasn't even viewed as immoral, and the chances are William the Conqueror himself made the slave trade in England illegal just so he could make a quick buck. Fast forward 700 years and the international transatlantic slave trade is in full swing, and yet we still do not have slaves in England. And this is where we meet a man named Granville Sharp, a very well-educated rationalist thinker of the Enlightenment, who became an active campaigner for the abolition of the slave trade. Granville had had previous legal success defending Jonathan Strong from his erstwhile slave master after being brought to England from the colonies, but we're going to look at the subsequent Somerset case. James Somerset was a slave from Virginia in America who had come to England with his master Charles Stuart in 1769 and had run away in October 1771. After evading slave hunters employed by Stuart for 56 days, Somerset had been caught, put onto the slave ship Anne and Mary to be taken to Jamaica and sold. Three Londoners had applied to Lord Mansfield for a writ of habeas corpus, which had been granted, with Somerset having to appear at a hearing on the 24th of January in 1772. Members of the public responded to the plight by sending money to pay for his lawyers, who in any event gave their services pro bono publico, while Stuart's costs were met by the West Indian planters and merchants. Given his prior legal experience with the Jonathan Strong case, Sharp briefed Somerset's lawyers. The judgment was delivered on the 22nd of June 1772, and it was a clear victory for Somerset, Sharp, and the lawyers who had acted for Somerset. Mansfeld acknowledged that English law did not allow slavery, and only a new act of Parliament could bring it into legality. The verdict established one thing very clearly. A slave becomes free the moment he sets foot on English soil. And this was, according to Lord Mansfield, that the air of England is too pure for any slave to breathe. No matter what reason William the Conqueror outlawed slavery for, by the time this judgment was drawn by Lord Mansfield, it had become a point of principle. This precedent wasn't set for Mansfield's personal interests. This precedent was set to determine right from wrong. Granville Sharp went on to co-found the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade with fellow like-minded Enlightenment thinkers. So what I'm getting from this is Britain had outlawed slavery there on British soil, but they th I think they were still involved in the actual transatlantic slave trade. Because I, I could swear from like history and stuff, I mean, America was working with Britain to bring slaves over here. That's my understanding of it. So we have a bit of a juxtaposition going on here where Britain itself was against slavery, but for whatever reason, they continued with the slave trade. Obviously, they are continuing with the slave trade because uh, Sharp here is an advocate against um, it and, and wants to end it. So that tells me that Britain was still involved with it at this point. But that is actually really impressive. I mean, kudos to you, Britain, for ending slavery way back when you did, being, I'm assuming, like one of the only countries, he said the only one, you know, maybe the only country that, that did that. I think it's an absolute shame, though, that we don't know the reasons for it. I think the church's reason might have been a moral one, but I don't know about William the Conqueror. That would be so interesting to research and try to see if there was any like writing, any anything out there that might have explained why he had that stance on it. I don't know, maybe for him it was also a moral issue as well. And after 20 long years of campaigning in Parliament, which I won't detail here, they were successful in their goal of abolishing the international slave trade in 1807. Now, if you know anything about 1807, you'll know that this was during the War of the Fourth Coalition, where Napoleon Bonaparte was savaging great powers all across the European continent. If you guys haven't watched my videos on the Napoleonic Wars yet, go do that. Um, I just wrapped up the Napoleonic Wars on Epic History TV, and I'm in the middle of doing Napoleon's Marshals, so I know all about what's going on right here. The Napoleonic Wars led to new territorial acquisitions for Britain and helped stuff Parliament with more abolitionists than they had before, which is why the bill providing for the abolition of the slave trade to conquered territories 
triumphantly passed in both houses. And the following year this was superseded by a stronger measure that outlawed the British Atlantic slave trade altogether. But, given the raging war in Europe, it was rather difficult to enforce due to a paucity of available resources. After 1807, the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, having achieved its goals, became the African institution, whose principal aim was to ensure the new legislation was enforced and that other countries followed Britain's example. Persuading other countries to join Britain outlawing the slave trade proved more difficult. Despite the efforts of the African institution and those of British ministers, the Congresses of Paris and Vienna in 1814 and 1815 both failed to reach a specific agreement. Given that this was at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, it's hardly surprising that there was French opposition. Where diplomacy had failed, the Royal Navy had to succeed. It's one thing declaring a writ that people may no longer profit from the trading of human beings, it's another thing to enforce that. Yeah. Enter the West African Squadron. The West African Squadron was a detachment of the Royal Navy that was given the task of blockading Africa, the continent, to make sure that slave traders were not taking slaves to the Americas. Needless to say, in 1807, there was only a token force performing this operation, comprising... Of okay, my question about this is... Um... Britain can have that stance, but other countries may not go along with it. As we just saw here with um, France and Italy, I, I guess, um, it was Vienna, right? No, that's Austria. <laughs> Vienna's in Austria. <laughs> oh my gosh. So we saw that they, they didn't quite cooperate with Britain's, you know, outlawing of slavery. Uh, it seems to me like Britain just kind of like applied that law to the rest of the world and expected everybody to go along with it. So to have Britain like just completely blockade everything and say you're not allowed to have slaves anymore you're not allowed to trade slaves anymore kind of dictating that to the entire world that's that's really like in your face assertive right there now i know that the british empire was huge and they had a lot of authority around the world at this point as well so particularly in the navy in the naval area so maybe they had the resources to do this and they were like you know just screw it we're gonna do it and people are gonna have to comply so i agree with the sentiment although the execution is a little i don't know i guess that just kind of surprises me a little bit that they would um choose to go about it in that way of two ships this number was increased to five ships, two ships? until the war of 1812 with the united five. states but after 1815 with britain victorious in europe and supreme at sea, the Royal Navy turned its attention back to the challenge. The institution of slavery was formally abolished in the British Empire in 1833, and by the 1850s, around 25 vessels and 2,000 officers and men were on the station, supported by nearly a thousand crewmen. Experienced. Okay, so what was the difference between the 1833 abolishment of slavery and the earlier one by William the Conqueror? I, I feel. I thought that was already a law. So did they have to like do it again in Parliament? 33. And by the 1850s, around 25 vessels and 2,000 officers and men were on the station, supported by nearly a thousand crewmen. Experienced fishermen recruited as sailors from what is now the coast of modern Liberia. It's worth noting that this was not a pleasant job and the mortality rate was five times higher for f compared with fleets in the Mediterranean or in home waters. To help incentivize the crew, money was actually given to each crew per slave that they freed. But there was a real zeitgeist in Britain for the abolition of slavery. For example, the pursuit and capture of slave ships became celebrated naval engagements, widely reported back in peacetime Britain. They became a source of national pride. So it's no wonder that many of the crews really did have an evangelical zeal about the anti-slavery patrolling. Mm. However, I don't want to give the impression that this was all for humanitarian reasons. There's no doubt that Britain, in her foreign policy, used her anti-slavery laws as a stick with which to beat her opponents, primarily the Spaniards and the Portuguese, who refused to conform to these demands. Britain demanded Spain, Portugal and the very new nation of Brazil to declare slave trading to be piracy. And while these nations paid lip service to these principles, they failed to enforce them, which led to a British blockade of Brazil by 1850, which of course forced the nascent Brazilian Empire to capitulate. And it didn't end there. 
In the 1860s, David Livingstone reports of Arab atrocities against enslaved Africans stirred up the interest of the British public, reviving the flagging abolitionist movement. Throughout the 1870s, the Navy attempted to suppress this abominable eastern trade at Zanzibar in particular. Needless to say, the British Navy continued their mission against the slavers across the Indian Ocean. The abolition of slavery became the British project. It captured the hearts and minds of the entire country, from the highest lord to the lowest peasant. This is certainly how the British saw it. For example, this spirit of chivalry, we see it in acts of heroism by land and sea, in fights against the slave trade. Alfred Tennyson, the unweary, unostentatious, and inglorious crusade of England against slavery may probably be regarded as among the three or four perfectly virtuous pages comprised in the history of nations. Will you yeah, see, it's, I feel like um, people don't know about it, you know? Like, this is the very first I'm hearing of this. And I and the way he's presenting this, it's like, this is like a, a big unknown thing to a lot of people in the world that Britain did this. So, like, I, you know, I'm saying, like, kudos to Britain for, for taking this stand. And, like, I totally get the sentiment behind it and wanting to spread this to the rest of the world and get the rest of the world behind this, because I think it's a good thing. William Leckie. All of this was done against the vested financial interests of hundreds of thousands of people, entire nations, were against the idea of abolishing slavery and the slave trade. The very notion was alien to the human existence yeah. until Britain made it happen. In the 19th century, if you saw a ship bearing down on you, flying this flag, and you were a slave trader, you knew that this flag stood for liberty. This was the flag of a nation that defied human convention for a point of principle and spent its blood, sweat, tears and treasure to enforce it on the world. This is the flag of the nation that accepted the absolute moral truth that slavery is wrong. No matter what riches can be amassed, no matter what power can be gained, no matter the cost, Slavery had to be abolished. That was the British Crusade. When Britain held the reins of world power, that is what she did with it. So Frankie, to be honest with you, when you say, we have streets named after slave owners, we have profited from a vile crime and feel no shame. It is British people that don't learn languages or British history. Britain is the true scrounger, the true criminal. I have to concur. British people apparently do not learn British history because Britain's involvement in the slave trade is one of the most proud moments any nation could have had in their history. I want to make one thing crystal clear, Frankie. You live in a world without slavery because of Britain. Well, on that last point there, um, he said earlier in the video that slavery still existed. <laughs> so it's not completely abolished around the world, but it largely is because of Britain. That's a really interesting point. Like for all of human existence, slavery was kind of a really commonplace thing. It was just part of our civilization, our society. People didn't really question it too much. And so for the British to come along and just kind of turn all of that upside down on its head, it completely changed the course of human history. So it's a really, really big deal what they did. And they did the world a huge, huge favor by taking that stance. What I felt was missing from this video is being an American, I was really, really interested in knowing what Britain's relationship with the US was during all of this. Um, he didn't really touch on that at all. And like I said, I had the impression that Britain aided the US in the slave trade up to a certain point, maybe around the 18, 1814, 1815, maybe 1807, I forgot what the date was on here. Uh, it kind of changed its stance on that and then stopped 
aiding the U.S. I do know that during the mid-1800s, Britain was trading with the southern United States a lot of cotton exports, which again were supported by slavery over here. And when it came to our Civil War, Britain was pretty neutral on it, but was leaning towards supporting the Confederates, the South, because of those economic exports. That's what I have heard, at least in the oversimplified videos on American Civil War. They, they brought up that point, and so I'm assuming that that's true, although I haven't really done a lot of my own research into that. So while I think this video might largely be true, I think there are some counterpoints that were left out of it, maybe? And those counterpoints have me still wondering about these questions that, that I have. So again, I am not bashing Britain. I think it's a fantastic thing. I, I actually had no idea that um, William the Conqueror had that stance on slavery, that the church had that stance on slavery, going back to the, um, you know, the early years of the last millennium. To me, that's really, really incredible that they had such a different stance on it from the rest of the world and that they made the decision to kind of like aggressively go after ending slavery. So I think there's a lot there to be admired. So that's definitely something that you have gained a ton of respect from me for Britain. Again, the slave trade is just one of those things that I don't know a lot about. You know, I've just heard, I've heard very surface level things about it my entire life. And in history, you know, we just don't really go that de in depth into it. So yeah, I don't know if there are any other videos out there that might answer my questions more about like, the British slash American relationship in all of this. I would be interested to watch those. Anyway, I think you guys have something to be really, really proud of over in the UK. I can definitely understand like national pride when it comes to stuff like this. So I appreciate all of the recommendations for this video. Again, if you can answer any of my questions down in the comments, please do that. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. Stay tuned for more stuff like this coming up and Roger here and I will see you next time.